In this final segment on Divide and Conquer Sorting, we'll discuss quicksort. So quicksort is quite interesting because rather than doing all of its work in the merge stage, like merge sort, it does all of its work in the divide stage using the partition algorithm. So it arbitrarily picks a number in the list of numbers that need to be sorted and it chooses that number as the partition. And then the partition algorithm will place all of the numbers that are less than the pivot to the left of it and greater than to the right of the pivot and return the location of the pivot. And then it will recurse on the sublists less than the pivot and greater than the pivot. Now, this also makes quicksort quite challenging to analyze because we don't necessarily know how large those recursive cases will be. I mean, we know a priori from some specific cases, but in general, we, we don't necessarily know the size that we're going to recurse on. It really does depend on the pivot, and that is what makes quicksort analysis so challenging. But first, let's just take a look at what quicksort is doing, and then we'll jump into the work of partition, which is doing the meaningful work of comparing the elements of the list to the pivot. Okay, so first, as long as we have a list, so we pass to it an array where you could use a vector starting in this and ending with uh, index. And as long as you have something to sort, so start is less than end, then we find the, the partition around the pivot. So we find the location where to put the pivot based on calling the partition algorithm. And then once we have the location of the pivot at location, then we call quicksort recursively on the sublist from the start to one before the pivot location, so on the left of the pivot, and then we call quicksort again on the sublist to the right of the, of the pivot, which is location plus one to the end. So now let's take a look more closely at the work that's being done by the partition algorithm. So the partition algorithm can pick an arbitrary element to be the pivot. But I just want to mention that in what we're working on, we are actually choosing the last element in our array to be the pivot. So now, as we look at the partition code, I just want to point out how some variables are using. So we're, we're being used. So we want to mention that we're past an array or a vector A, and a left endpoint and a right endpoint in which we're trying to place the pivot in the right location between those endpoints. So now we set i, and i is going to be used for the location, to keep track of the location, to place the pivot. And it's going to be keeping track of the number of elements in the array that are less than the pivot. And we set the pivot, as I mentioned, so we just choose the pivot to be the last element in the array. This is arbitrary. We'll talk more about the choice of what the pivot is. And then what we do is we go through the array from left to right. So J is going from the left endpoint to the right endpoint. And it's comparing all of the elements in the array to the pivot. If the element is less than the pivot, we are going to swap the current element with where we wanted to place the pivot thus far and increment the location for the pivot because we just placed an element which is less than it. So that's why we're incrementing i. And then finally, once we've gone through the entire array from left to right, we should know where to place the pivot. And we swap the pivot with the location. And you'll notice that i is keeping track of the number of elements in the list that are less than or equal to the pivot. OK, and then once we're done, we return the location of where the pivot was placed. So now, let's just trace through this more carefully. And I just want to make a little chart here and I'm going to be keeping track of i and j. So i is where we want to place the pivot. So it's keeping track of the number of elements in the list less than the pivot. And j is keeping track of just going from left to right. So we, when we start off, they're both equal to 0. So we're just assuming we could put the pivot in the first location and looking at the first value in the array. So we look at the first value in the array. And here we're looking at 3. 
and right now we're at the for loop. So we're looking at three, and we are comparing three, which is at at array position A0, to seven. So A0, which is three, is less than the pivot, which is seven. So you'll notice that we would swap it with itself. So it wouldn't actually do anything, but we would increment i. So now we increment i right here, i and j. And now we have to compare 6 and 7. 6 is a less than 7, so we'd essentially swap it with itself, and we increment i and j. And now we are at 2 in the array, which is 8. 8 is not less than the pivot 7. So here we'll notice that i stays the same because 8 is not less than 7, but j advances to the third index into the array. So now on this iteration of the for loop, we're looking at position 3, a3 in this array, which is 1, and comparing it to the pivot. So 1 is less than the pivot 7. So what we need to do is swap i and j. So right here, this is where we get the swap at positions 2 and 3. And you can see this is where we're swapping 1 and 8. After we do that swap, we have to advance the pivot where we would place the pivot, so that's 3, and then advance j. So now j is looking at 5, so the array index is 4, so a4 is 5. So now we consider 5 and compare it to the pivot. So 5 is less than 7, so what we need to do now is we have to do this next swap. So here we're doing a swap at positions 3 and 4. And you'll notice when we do this swap here is where 5 and 8 are swapped. So as a result of that now we advance I, which is where we want to put the pivot, so that's keeping track of the number of elements less than the pivot, and you'll notice that we've come across 4, and we increment J5. So J now has exhausted the entire array, so we break out of that for loop, and the only thing that we have left to do is one last swap, and this last swap you'll see is swap 4 and 5. So this we're going from here to swapping 4 and 5 and you'll notice that is why we have 7 before 8. And then we would return the location where we just placed the pivot so it would return i equal 4 because we just placed the pivot in location 4 in the array. So now I just want to try one more trace of the partition algorithm. So here we won't have the code, we'll just talk entirely through what is happening. So now I'm just going to write the, our vector. So we have our vector 7, 5, 3, 1, 4. And as I mentioned before, we just arbitrarily pick the pivot. So our pivot is the largest element. So this is our pivot, and this is the, uh, at location 4 in our vector. So this is vector is equal to our pivot and it's just the value the value just happens to be 4 so now let's start doing our tracing so we have i is keeping track of the number of integers in the list less than the pivot and j is just being used to traverse the rest of the list from left to right so let's start doing the comparison now so now i take the element at position 0 7 and i compare it to the pivot so 7 verse 4, 7 is not 
less than four. So I don't advance the number of elements i less than the pivot, but I do have to advance j. So I look at j. Uh, five is not less than four, so I don't advance i, the number of elements less than the pivot, but I do advance j. So now I have j equal to two, so I'm looking at the element in index two in the vector, so that is three. Three is less than four. So when we come across an element that is less than the pivot, we have to do our swap. So we're gonna do a swap now, and we're gonna swap at where we had the pivot, so that's gonna be i equals zero, and j is equal to two. So when we do this, you'll notice that we will be swapping three and seven. So I'm just gonna do the swap now. So that's how we get from this list to this one is that we're just doing the swap right there and the pivot remains the same. But you'll notice that now once we've done that swap, we've ad now advanced the location of the pivot i, the number of elements that we found less than the pivot, is now going to be at position one. And j will now be here at position three. Now, when we compare the element at position j, in this case three, so the vector at position three is the value i, i is less than the pivot four, so this tells us that we have to do another swap. And the swap is going to be with i and j. So here the swap is going to be with i equal one and j equal three. And when we do this, you'll notice that now we are going to have three, one, seven, five, and four. So that's, we just did the swap between one and five in order to get that. And once we've done that swap, what have we realized is now we have to advance the location of where we'll place the pivot because we found two elements less than the pivot, so that's i equal two. And now you'll notice that j is equal to four. So that means we've exhausted the for loop, inner for loop, and we know where we need to place the pivot now, which is at position two. So what we can do is we would do one last swap. We would swap i equal two and i equal, uh, excuse me, j well, this is location of the pivot, we just wherever the pivot is at. So this was, we were calling this R before, the pivot location. And when we do this, we get the pivot in the right position. So we get three, one, four, five, and seven. So you'll notice we have placed the pivot in position two. So this partition function should return i equal two as the pivot location. And what is helpful to remember is that with i equal to two, that is telling us that there are two elements in the vector that are less than the pivot value. So now I want to just bring this back to quicksort also. So what happens is once we have this location, we are then going to make two recursive calls. So we go, we basically have two sublists uh, around the pivot now. We have the location going from zero to one, and then we also from going from three to four. So quicksort would be make the following two recursive calls. Around the sublist that are created by placing the pivot. So it would make recursive calls of quicksort with our vector, 
and it's going to go from position zero, the start of the vector, to right before the pivot, which was placed at two, so that's going to be one, and then it's going to make its second recursive call on the vector, but then it has to go from right after the pivot, starting at five, so this will be, the, the pivot is at location two, so we'll start at location three, through the end of the vector, which is location four. So those are the two recursive calls that would be made after the pivot was placed. And as you can see, we don't really know what the size of those recursive calls are going to be unless we actually know how many values are less than the pivot. So we have to know what the pivot value is. So this is what makes the runtime analysis of quicksort so uh, very challenging. So now I want to talk about this a little bit. Now we won't get too deeply into this, but just to explain some of the challenges with doing the runtime analysis of quicksort now. Okay, so there are some things that we know very quickly about the runtime analysis of quicksort. So the very worst case quicksort could ever have is if you happen to pick a pivot, which is the minimum or the maximum of the subarray that you are looking at. And when we do this, each recursive call is just going to be on a list of just one element removed from the list, which is just when you place the pivot in the minimum or maximum position. And when you do that, you'll notice that our recurrence is going to be linear time and then our recursive call on a list of just one fewer elements. And the linear time is the, the time you actually have to go through the entire list to realize that the, the, the pivot is the minimum or the maximum, and then you just have to make a recursive, just one recursive call on everything else on the list because you, you didn't actually have a, a, su a sub half or less than or greater than the pivot because it's either the minimum or the maximum value. So that's not so not so not so useful when you happen to be unlucky and the pivot happens to be the minimum or the maximum and when you handle this uh, recurrence you'll notice that this is going to give us a runtime that's actually quadratic now the best that we can do is if we happen to pick a pivot every time that was the median we basically would get the same behavior essentially as merge sort because then we would have to do the linear work to find the location for the, piv the pivot using the partition algorithm, and then we would make the two recursive calls on equal halves of the array. So then we get the same uh, recurrence relation that we had for merge sort, and as we saw, that this would be theta of n log n. Okay, so those are the quick cases with quick sort in terms of we, can, we know this analysis very quickly, the runtime. But as you can imagine, if we don't know that, and there is some subtlety too to how do you make sure you always pick the pivot to be the me uh, median and, and not increasing the runtime, um, what happens to the runtime? So we know that the worst case is n squared. We know that the best case is n log n. It turns out that you can show if you just randomly picked a pivot, you would have n log n runtime and the average case for quicksort also. So we won't get m more into that analysis, but I just want to mention that the takeaway is that the runtime analysis of quicksort is dependent on the pivot, the choice of the pivot, because that determines the sizes of the recursive calls in the recurrence relation that you would use to analyze the runtime. And I just want to mention that is for these compared compare Risen based shorting, this is the best we can do. And login is the best that we can do for this comparison based sorting.